Hey guys, happy summer. It's crazy. Um, so we're going to do a new read aloud and it is called Dear America, the Diary of Margaret Ann Brady. So I'm going to go ahead and give you guys um, a little preview of what the book is about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read that so we can kind of uh, prepare for what we're about to hear. So it says, five years ago, Margaret Ann Brady's older brother left her in the care of an orphanage and immigrated to America. When the orphanage receives an unusual request for a traveling companion, Margaret's teachers agree that she is the perfect candidate to accompany Mrs. Carstairs on the Titanic. Once Margaret arrives in the United States, she can finally be united with her brother. But the luxury liner is destined for an astonishing tragedy of the most terrifying proportions, and Margaret's journey becomes a nightmare when the ship collides with an iceberg. Will she live to see her brothers again? We're going to see. So this story is all about um, Margaret and then her, it's like kind of written in journal entries. So um, it's first person on her point of view on the Titanic. Let's get started. All right, London, England, 1912. <clears throat> Tuesday, 28th of March, 1912. St. Abernathy's Orphanage for Girls, Whitechapel, London, England. I feel rather a fool writing down my thoughts, but this evening, Sister Catherine made the very firm suggestion that I keep, start keeping a diary and handed me a brand new tablet from the supply closet for that very purpose. She says that everything has changed for me now, and I will be disappointed later if I do not keep a written record. Feeling that, she assured me that she would be disappointed. In all honesty, I so prefer to guard my privacy that I did not think I would accept such a directive from anyone else, but my fondness for her is such that it seems only proper to follow her advice. In any case, there's no question but that today was nothing if not eventful. One moment, my life was mundane. Mere hours later, the whole world seemed new and different. Mundane. It's like bored, boring, dull. It was mid-morning and I was in the midst of a clumsy declamation. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. And I was summoned to the Sister Mary Gregoria's office. I went with great uneasiness as I had been somewhat unruly at breakfast I would now almost certainly have to serve my penance in the form of chores. So she has to do chores unruly at breakfast. Maybe she wasn't following the rules. Margaret Ann, Sister Gregoria said, her voice surely as loud as, bow as bow bells. She waved a piece of paper at me and then pointed at the chair where she wanted me to sit. I have been known to post a solemn note here and there in the common rooms, proposing peculiar new policies and scrawling a facsimile of Sister Mary Gregoria's signature below, but this sheet did not look familiar. It would be a shame to be punished for the offense of another, and yet, truth be told, probably not altogether undeserved. Then Sister Catherine bustled in, murmuring an apology for her tardiness. Obviously, she and I are close, so I sensed whatever punishment I was getting this time would not be too severe. When I first came here some five years ago, I do not think I spoke at all for several months. It was a dark and unhappy time and I rarely ate or slept through the night. I was assigned as my regular task to assist Sister Catherine in the library. During those early days, I felt shy around the jolly stout woman in the sweeping black habit, but soon I grew to depend on her kindnesses. When I felt most alone, she would always be there with a smile, a book she thought I might enjoy, a hot cup of sweet milky tea. Now, that smell, book cluttered, small book cluttered room is the one place in the world that feels like home to me. Sister Catherine is very wise and has guided my studies far beyond my basic classwork with the hope that I might even attend a university one day. Other than my brother William, I believe she is my favorite person. Margaret Ann, Sister Mary Gregoria said again once Sister Catherine had settled herself upon a flimsy wooden chair. I am told it is your wish to go into service. I want to do no such thing, but neither do I fancy ending up back in the back alleys of Whitechapel or even worse in a workhouse. So I nodded in a grave manner. William has been trying to save enough money to secure my passage to America for now two years. If I were also able to work, I could help with my fair share. 
William is the only family I have in the world and I'm eager to join him over there. Should you like to be a companion, Margaret Ann? Sister Mary Gregoria asked. Since I was not sure what that meant, I did not know how to respond. This will give you so many more opportunities, Sister Catherine said, her face bright with happiness. It is exactly what I would have wished for you, Margaret. I knew she would only tell me the truth, so I nodded. Then I took, then I turned to look at Sister Mary Gregory and presented her with a very large smile. I should love to be a companion, I said. And so it was that I set forth to the city that afternoon with Sister Catherine as my chaperone. Then hours grow late, the hours grow late and I am tired. So I think I will tell of our city adventure in the morning. Friday, 29th of March, 1912. St. Abernathy's Orphanage for Girls, Whitechapel. None of the sisters felt I ought to be wandering about the streets by myself, which is why Sister Catherine was to accompany me. There was great concern about what I should wear on our jaunt to the city since they wanted very much for me to make a good impression. As a rule, the sisters' only concern was our that our clothing was clean. We wear very plain, simple dresses and do our best to keep them in good condition. Some of the merchants in Petticoat Lane donate their cast-offs to the orphanage, but they are, of course, not top quality garments. In the end, I was decided that I would wear a dark blue frock, which once belonged to one of the older girls. Sister Celeste arranged my hair neatly, and I used a soft cloth to rub a bit of shine into my button boots. Perhaps it goes without saying that Sister Catherine wore her habit. I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, like nuns in the church, um, but they wear like black, it's called a habit, like black and white head cut things to cover their heads. That's what that is. I was eager to take the underground since I have scarcely ever traveled that way, but instead we rode on a motor bus to the Piccadilly Circus, which isn't really a circus. It's just a place. Sister Catherine was strangely nervous and silent, so I spent my time staring out the window. When I was very small, mummy and father would take us to the city once in a great while. I remember picnic in Regent's Park and another day when we stood and stared at Buckingham Palace with great admiration. Piccadilly was crowded with enticing food stalls, street performers, and other lovely sights. I was very hungry, and the vendors' cries of oatmeal pies and taters made my stomach rumble. Many a man passing by raised his hat to Sister Catherine and murmured, Afternoon, Sister, before continuing on his way. Sister Catherine was very concerned that we would lose our way, and she stopped to ask someone for directions. I knew only that we were going to a fine hotel in Mayfair to meet a rich American lady for tea. We walked for several blocks, turning right and left and right again. I wanted to tarry on Seville Row to scrutinize the windows of its exclusive clothing stores, but Sister Catherine felt that we had no time to linger. As we walked vigorously, I enjoyed watching the fine ladies and gentlemen strolling about with pretty parasols and mahogany walking sticks, and the ladies wore the most astonishing hats. Perhaps my frock was too humble for the likes of Mayfair. The name of the hotel was Claridge's, and it looked so fancy that I was shy about going inside. Sister Catherine had stopped, so perhaps she felt timid too. Margaret Ann, she said, sounding terribly serious, I must remind you that there are times when it is best to sit quietly and merely listen. I am afraid I am often so eager to be clever that I speak without thinking. Same. When Sister Catherine is cross, she calls me saucy girl. This always makes me laugh, and then she is even more cross. Nary a word, I promised. Remember, she is American, Sister said. Be kind. I nodded. I've heard that Americans have simply dreadful accents and tend to be lacking in characteristics like reserve and dignity. I decided for the time being to suspend my judgment. Two young men in elegant uniforms stood at either side of the entrance to the hotel. When they saw us, they promptly swung the great doors open and ushered us inside. I must admit, I felt like a princess. Never had I been in such luxurious surroundings. The floor were of marble, were made of marble so shiny, I do believe I could see my own reflection in them. A beautiful staircase loomed ahead of us and the ceiling sparkled with chandeliers. <coughs> Excuse me. Sister Catherine asked another uniformed man to direct us to the foyer, which is where we were to meet Mrs. Frederick Carstairs for tea. The man bowed and motioned for us to come along. We were taken into a lovely room where a quartet was playing live music. Everywhere, ladies sat at small exquisite tables while graceful footmen served them tea. 
The air was filled with sounds of chamber music, delicate china clinking and soft conversations. We were led to a table where a plump middle-aged woman sat. She was wearing an ornate flowery hat, a boxy dress and long gloves, all in various shades of minty green. Can you guys picture that? Something about her posture put me in a mind of a spring pigeon. Seeing us, she lowered her glasses and looked at me, looked me over with a critical eye. Mrs. Carstairs, I am Sister Catherine from St. Abernathy's, Sister Catherine said, and may I present Miss Margaret Ann Brady. Mrs. Carstairs studied me and then extended her hand. I was startled by her forwardness, but then reminded myself that she was, after all, American, and forced myself to return the gesture. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> She gave my hand an abrupt shake, then dropped it. I am very pleased to meet you, Mrs. Carstairs, I said as polite as can be. I noticed then that she was holding a small, rather smug brown terrier. Although I prefer cats, I am terribly fond of all animals. What a delightful pet, I said, and I reached out to stroke her. Don't, Mrs. Carstairs said sharply, her voice loud enough to make me wince. She doesn't take to strangers. By then, the dog was already licking my hand. Mrs. Carstairs seemed surprised, but not displeased. Sister Catherine had the exact opposite reaction. Once we were seated and Mrs. Carstairs had told me that the dog's name was Florence, one of the uniformed footmen appeared with a steaming teapot to fill our cups. I had never seen such a glorious tea. Plate upon plate of small sandwiches, crumpets, scones, cakes, and petites fours. I am always hungry. Sister Catherine says I grow an inch every fortnight, and I wanted to eat my fill and then gather up the rest to bring back to Nora, who is the youngest child at St. Abernathy's, and to whom I am quite partial. Mrs. Carstairs nibbled a bit of the sandwich here, a taste of shortbread there. I tried to make each half of sandwich last for three full bites, though I could easily pop them into my mouth hole. But I knew my manners would reflect upon Sister Catherine, so I endeavored to be discreet. Cucumber, salmon, roast beef, watercress, soft white cheese, thinly sliced ham. The sandwich variety seemed endless. If you began to empty your plate, the cheerful footman appeared to want at once to replace it. Because of this, I liked him very much and smiled broadly at him each time. However, do you stay so slim? Mrs. Carstairs asked by and by, her voice a bit stiff. I took this as a hint to restrain myself, although Sister Catherine sprang to my offense with her inch of fortnight explanation. This was followed by a brief discussion of how tall I am for my age, and Mrs. Carstairs seemed somewhat dismayed to discover that I'm only 13. Sister Catherine instantly assured her that I've always been mature upon my years, although I will concede there are a few times when that is probably debatable. I am surprised to find your accent so refined, Mrs. Carstairs said, seeming now to remember that I was at the table. You sound very learned. Although I had been silent for quite some time, I naturally assumed that what she wanted to hear, that meant she wanted to hear a somewhat learned remark. Oh, to be in England, now that April's there, I responded. Ah, Mrs. Carstairs said, although she looked uncomfortable. It was, I was, it was quiet for a moment, then she asked if it was Keats. I thought surely she was having a bit of fun with me, so Sister Catherine responded softly, Robert Browning. Mrs. Carstairs gave that some consideration, then remarked upon the fine job the sisters had done of educating me. So she said a line from a poem, and Mrs. Carstairs wasn't sure who wrote that poem. In truth, I can rip out a right impressive string of Cockney, as only it befits one born in Wapping. That would singe the ears off a sailor, but... I also have never found it difficult to mim mimic the accents of others. Mummy always said I had a fine ear and might well be musical were I ever to get the opportunity to learn an instrument. The pianoforte, she hoped. I enjoy music and would have been happy with a mouth organ. Once, Father found me a penny whistle upon which I blew nonstop until Mummy decided to put it away for a time. Father had a beautiful light brogue and often when we spoke, I would lapse into my own. This gave him no end of amusement and, I hope, pleasure. He was very proud of his roots, County Cork and Ireland, to be sure, and told me many wonderful stories about the old country and the wondrous sights to be found there. Sister Yulela, who grew up a very proper young lady in Kensington, had always been very strict about our pronunciations. H's, she says in snappish tones. I want to hear your H's. Then one of my classmates will promptly say, 
sure. And hits an heavenly day out it tis. Whereupon Sister Yolela puts her head down upon her desk. Often I cannot resist speaking to her in the broadest Miss Mangled Cockney imaginable. She tells me I am very, very wicked and then slaps a ruler across my knuckles to punctuate the scolding. This may not bode well for my future as a piano pianoforte virtuoso. You have a pleasant demeanor, said Mrs. Carstairs, but I sense some mischief about you. I wanted to laugh but knew that would only confirm her suspicions. So I lowered my head in a shy manner and quietly sipped tea. I was still very hungry, but confined myself to a small piece of sponge cake. After a time, it was decided that I should take Florence for a short walk while Sister Catherine and Mrs. Carstairs spoke privately. The dog I saw now wore a jeweled collar and a light pink silken lead. I took her out through the opulent lobby and we wandered through Bond Street before returning. Florence had a sprightly gait and seemed to enjoy barking at everyone and everything we passed. Cannot imagine why she, for example, found the gas lights objectionable, but to her credit, she was a spirited animal, if foolishly small. When we returned to the foyer, Sister Catherine and Mrs. Carstairs were still speaking in low, serious voices. Remarkably bright child, Sister Catherine was saying, and very congenial. Given the charming tenor of their conversation, I was loath to interrupt. However, they stopped once they saw me. Upon entering the hotel, Florence had jumped into my arms, where she was now lounging happily. Mrs. Carstairs looked at us and seemed to make up her mind. Margaret Ann, would you like to go to America? She asked. I wanted nothing more. I should be delighted, I said. Okay, so we're going to stop there. That was two days that Margaret was recounting, and we will pick up from there. So we'll follow her journey on the Titanic. Excited to see where it goes.